The second reading today comes from the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 through 28. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself again and again as the high priests enter the holy place year after year with blood that is not their own. For then he would have to suffer and had to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once and after that that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. This is the word of the God for the people of God. Thank you very much. Well, uh, last year I had the opportunity to listen to my wife give one of her Methodist history talks at Emory Grove. Anyone here know about Emory Grove? Anyone been to Emory Grove? Beautiful. Wonderful. I imagine you would have. Absolutely. Knowing what little I do know about you. But anyway, um, Emory Grove is a historic site for United Methodists and it's located in Glendon. Now, uh, in case you didn't know, my wife, the Reverend Dr. Bonnie McCubbin, uh, manages like the 31 historic um, sites of Methodism here uh, in Baltimore and all the surrounds. Uh, And um, this one, Emory Grove, is particularly important uh, because it's where camp meetings came from. Now, you might not know what a camp meeting is, but back in 1868, camp meetings were all the rage. Uh, They were held there every summer. They were kind of like a Christian Woodstock. And folks would gather for about a week to participate in raucous worship for the time and enjoy passionate teaching and preaching. They would literally set up like a community of Christians right there in the Glen. Um, Today, the grounds host the residents of a number of privately owned cottages that have been handed down for generations by some families. My wife almost, bought, my wife and I almost bought one uh, recently, but we decided against it at the last moment. It's just uh, a very beautiful image, um, and we're quite keen on Methodist history, as you can imagine, in our household. Now, while I was there. I became fast friends with an older gentleman named Bob, uh, who later became a parishioner of mine, and he got to talking to me about an experience he had had with a friend as he tried to explain what Jesus meant when he was referred to as the Son of Man. Okay, Bob, you know, heady concept. Um, I, I heard him out, and while it became apparent almost immediately that our political leanings were very different, um, he was very well informed. I let him know, hey, you, you've kind of got all the basics down right there. And he was very interested in what I had to say about it. So as I explained it to him, um, the first thing I said was that there's a whole lot more to the terms that we use for God and for Jesus than people realize. Normally when people use a term for God and try to explain it, uh, they try to define it, like it's just like a nice, neat thing that we just open a book and, oh, there's the definition. Um, The reality is it's a little bit more than that. So the Son of Man is one of the titles for the Jewish Messiah. And that was a big deal at the time that the term was used because You may or may not know that the history of Judaism is a history of being conquered again and again and thrust into exile called diaspora. And this idea of one day a redeemer of creation sent from heaven to conquer evil and usher in a new earth was very appealing. This idea of a God of justice that would one day redeem all the peoples of Israel and bring them together to be in their own land was hugely popular. Now, of all the titles that we as Christians give to Jesus, I would say it's very important for us to understand that history 
Because as I explained to Bob, Christian education really shouldn't just be about defining things. When you just define something and don't make it consequential for your life, it's just philosophy. It doesn't do anything for you. It's just one more thing you can agree to or disagree with. So this takes philosophy and it makes it more real. That's the goal. So if we call Jesus the Son of Man, that's effectively declaring Jesus as Lord. And if you've been baptized, you know that one of the vows of baptism, you're accepting Jesus as Lord. You accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, etc., etc. And that carries with it certain divine expectations. And I hope we all understand that. It's not just a matter of taking a vow. You're not vowing to a community, you're vowing before God. And God expects something of us when we take those vows. Now, understanding what it means to call Jesus our Lord is critical not just to our faith, but to how we represent our beliefs through our conduct. You know, there's the old song, you know, they'll know we are Christians by our love, of course. Um, but I would say that God expects there to be a transformation in our conduct when we declare Jesus Christ as our Lord. In fact, the ability to really represent this, this idea of Jesus as Lord, was so important for someone like me because before I could even become a pastor or even initiate the process, I had to be able to explain to the Board of Ordained Ministry, that's the governing body that um, oversees uh, the ministry process for all pastors in the Methodist Church, I had to explain to them, to their satisfaction, um, that, you know, what, what does it mean to declare Jesus as Lord? Now, I had the benefit of experience and education, but even having those things, it's still really difficult. And I had to represent that in paperwork and in oral examination. So I would say that understanding what it means to call Jesus Lord is right at the core of what it means to have true faith in the tenets that we follow as Christians. It really helps us understand what should be driving us, you know, what motivates us, and also what gives us hope in dark times. If it's just philosophy, it doesn't give hope. I would say that if I had never become a Christian, if I had just been left to my own devices, I wouldn't have a lot of hope for the world. I imagine I'd be a lot more cynical than I currently am. It's not because of the woes of every day that we hear in the news. I mean, with every news cycle, there's just one more thing to get depressed about, of course. And frankly, for a certain subset of the population, our recent presidential election, you know? No, not really. It, it boils down to me, to how we treat each other, frankly. I don't have a lot of faith in people because of this. You know, how we regard one another. I don't put much stock in human regard because, you know, it's, it's just so convenient. I want to be regarded as a human being, you know, as someone worthy of dignity and respect, much like yourself. But I also know that no matter what I do, or what I believe, or what I profess, I'm always going to be something less than human for certain people. It's just the way it is. It's sad, but it's true. Historically speaking, that has been true of humanity since we first learned to separate ourselves into tribes. All too easy to blame the problems of our world on the other tribe. The ability to dehumanize is one of the chief sources of evil in this world and has always justified our drive to destroy others and rob them of their freedom when it is convenient for us. Not even the scriptural account is exempt from this dehumanization. You know, God certainly inspired scripture, but it was penned by men. The way foreign nations are described in the Hebrew scriptures is classic dehumanization. 
The enemies of the ancient Israelites are categorized metaphorically as beasts. Literally the words of the English translation of the text, devouring locusts, lions, hyenas, serpents. And given the male-centric nature of the language found in the Bible, the term son of man obviously doesn't refer to anyone from those other nations, but unique specifically to the Hebrew peoples. It refers to the humanity of the Hebrew people and the divinity of God. The son of man wouldn't arise from one of those people, the heathen peoples of the world being mere animal savages, of course not. So when we talk about the son of man, we're talking about a Jew. Strangely enough, for all the bad rap that foreigners catch in scripture, there are other perspectives that hold these folks up as models of the very best to be found in human beings. The classic one in the New Testament, in the Gospels, is the Good Samaritan, someone that is loathed entirely by the Jewish society of the time, is held up by Jesus as someone of morality, you know, willing to help their brother in need. Kind of weird to do that, Jesus, but it's all rooted in the Old Testament. Here's a couple of examples. God hears the cries of Hagar, one of the foreign-born wives of Abraham, the patriarch of patriarchs, and spares her life and that of her son Ishmael when Abraham casts them out under some pretty dark circumstances. A man named Elimelech gathers his estate in Bethlehem during a time of famine and moves his family to the land of Moab, Israel's old arch nemesis in the Bible. And his sons marry Moabite women. That's a big no-no in their culture, intermarriage. One of those is called Ruth. Yes, the Ruth, who is widowed and then marries a man from Israel named Boaz. And together they have a son named Obed, the grandfather of King David. Now, I could give you many more references, but I think you get the point. I think you see where I'm going with this. There's this back and forth in the Bible between what people think God is and what God really does. And that's not surprising, really, when you consider how many sources came together to form our holy scriptures. It seems that God doesn't favor those from the right nationality or observe the right religious practices. God favors those who do righteousness. In these times of uncertainty, so many people seem to care less and less about righteousness and more about showing strength. Morality is something that has become very ambiguous and relative, you know, because frankly, of the discomfort of many in doing what is right over what they think is right, even if it means robbing people that they don't like of their God-given humanity. And you see this all the time now, you know? People don't really view each other as equals, not really. We, we might not explicitly refer to people we don't like as beasts, you know? But we do treat people differently based on an internal rubric that was partly passed down to us from our elders and partly based on our own sensibilities. I have an unfortunate example of this that happened just this last week. I was with my kids at Annie's Playground the other day in Harford County and I overheard some boys uh, poking fun at Asians saying that they ate household pets, you know, an obvious callback to a recent accusation against Haitian immigrants living in Springfield, Ohio, completely debunked since then by local authorities. I mean, children don't naturally talk that way, you know, they're innocent. That kind of talk has a source, you know, an adult one, an adult one. In the entirety of Hebrew scripture, the title Son of Man appears 107 times, 93 times in Ezekiel alone. That's my second favorite book of the Bible, by the way. And 14 times elsewhere. But there is one place 
one place that informs the Christian idea of Jesus referring to himself as the Son of Man. And that's Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And it says, As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being, a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient one and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. So did you catch that? All people, right? No more divisions. All would serve. All could serve. All were now effectively human. You know, you've also got that word there too, dominion. So in the original language, the word is shaltan. It denotes sovereignty or belonging to the realm of a figure with ultimate authority. Scripture often refers to God as a king, you know, a king we serve. But you need to bear in mind that the authors were doing their best using the limitations of language to describe a relationship with our sovereign. I mean, God doesn't need anything from us the way that a monarch might, you know. For example, one pays taxes to a monarchy in goods or money. You know, fealty is sworn to the monarchy, acknowledging that all law and order is set by the monarchy. And historically speaking, males were expected to serve in the army of the monarch at the time of war. Our God has no use for human armies. None whatsoever. Being the very Lord of hosts, another title we have for God. The head of heavenly armies. Even more striking there in Daniel is that the one coming on the clouds would be a son of man, utterly human. The line between divinity and humanity would be blurred with such a one. It truly speaks to the notion that God is not limited by the divisions we come up with. Yes, even those that we use to separate God and people. And the scripture says that all dominion would be given over to this son of man, which sounds really impressive until you understand that if all people serve this sovereign, there are no enemies to fight. No enemies at all. What an amazing concept for this world, you know? So divided as it is by territories and ideology and corruption and injustice. There in Daniel, God says, the kingdom of God is the whole world. All people, nations, languages, customs. That's incredible. We can be different and yet unified. Such a thing is impossible for people. But in God, all things are possible. Only God could do something like that. Jesus has another title that seems to stand in stark contrast to this image of the Son of Man. And that's the Lamb of God. Now, both exist as seeming opposites to each other. But as I explained to the children, both must be held together if we're to understand who Jesus was and is for us. This title for Jesus comes from the Gospel of John, where John the Baptist, his cousin, sees Jesus and proclaims, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, the Son of Man also takes away the sin of the world. That's kind of the whole point there. But the image of the Son of Man is far more authoritarian than that of the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God is the sacrifice made so that all who sin would be saved. It's rooted in an ancient tradition of sacrificial offering made to God when seeking forgiveness for sin. It is a direct reference to the work of Jesus on the cross. 
of this St. Augustine, one of the early fathers of the ancient Christian church, wrote, why a lamb in his passion, because he underwent death without being guilty of any iniquity. Why a lion in his passion, because being slain, he slew death. Why a lamb in his resurrection, because his innocence is everlasting. Why a lion in his resurrection, because everlasting also is his might. The image of the Son of Man and the Lamb of God depict an authoritative spiritual leader who is not only righteous, but sacrificial. I'll say it again. Sacrificial. For this leader is not content with his personal righteousness, but works tirelessly so that all would find their righteousness. Some artistic depictions of the Lamb of God show a lamb holding a banner with a red cross bleeding into a chalice. I mean, what an image when you consider what Holy Communion is for us. An almost literal sharing in the body and the blood of Christ. I think we would all do well to remember these aspects of Jesus. We would all do well to remember that our righteousness is not something that we can bring about ourselves or even boast of when we think we've found it. It must be empowered by the one we've come to believe in or we are merely deluding ourselves. Remember that the next time someone around you, or maybe even you, entertains the notion that we are not all created equal. God welcomes all, bids all to serve all, because Christ knew what it felt like to be thrust aside and dehumanized. We serve others because we know what it feels like to be underserved and what it feels like to receive care. We help people feel like they belong because we know what it is to be rejected and then accepted. And all of this is empowered by a savior who knew this pain and its redemption intimately in his very flesh, rising again as he did from the sting of death. Despite his human frailty, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. A magnificent illustration of the Lamb of God comes to us from the Moravian Church, whose emblem is the Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God. And the Agnus Dei holds a flag of victory surrounded by the Latin inscription, Visit Agnus Noster Eum Sequamur, in English, our Lamb has conquered, let us follow him. May the Lamb of God grant you the courage to forsake all others and follow him and him alone. Let's let God's people say, Amen.